He served as the United States Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of Korea based in Seoul. He previously held positions in the Department of Defense, including as Chief of Staff to Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and as uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. Uh, the top officials in the Pentagon for all Asia issues. Uh, Ambassador Lippert also worked in the White House as Chief of Staff to the National Security Council in 2009, and he served in the United States Navy as an intelligence officer in support of Navy, Naval Special Warfare teams with deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, among other service. Now, uh, please join me in welcoming Ambassador uh, Lippert. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Great honor to be here. Uh, thanks, thanks for, thanks to everybody for inviting me. And it's right on cue that uh, you know our, our nanny's calling me, and I'm sure it's some uh, crisis with our kids. No, I'm joking. No, I know what it's about. So it's all good. Uh, and she's Korean too. So uh, you know, usually we we could I could you know do a little Korean with her, mainly about you know diapers and gomse uh, mori and things like that. So anyway. Um, Let's 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 let me just say, um, you know, just I'll start by saying, um, you know, that I'm supposed to talk about the North Korean economy today, uh, and I, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the interplay between the North Korean economy, sanctions, politics, all of that. That's kind of the the main uh, theme of the talk today. Point one. The second thing that I would say is that. Um, if anybody tells you that they know everything about the North Korean economy, um, don't believe that person, right? Uh, don't buy a, a used car from that person because this is a very uh, opaque, difficult, analytic subject to penetrate. And it's precisely why you ha I have to commend uh, GW and the KDI school for having a conference on this often overlooked, understudied, but yet critically important topic. And in fact, I talked to a friend of mine who's a reporter, wrote a book on, on this subject last night, and he told me that the single most important thing about, in North Korean society is how money flows. Um, and so I think, again, to be, I just wanted to preface it, set this, the stage here by saying this is an incredibly important topic, um, but again, something that is often misunderstood uh, or understudied. So. Um, to that end, what I wanted to do was offer some observations, uh, what I would call a work, working hypotheses, uh, based on you know multiple sources, people I talked to here in town, journalists, re readings, all of that, and then really get into a dialogue, a dewa, because I think part of the exercise here is less about me giving a lecture and more about testing our hy hypotheses, learning from each other, and driving our understanding and knowledge of this critically important subject. So that was what I wanted to say at the outset. Uh, so let me start by saying, you know, my opinion, my position on the state of the overall North Korean economy is that it's a very sick patient, it's grossly inefficient, it's corrupt. The Bank of Korea just said there's negative growth. So by no means is this a healthy economy. In fact, again, it's a very sick economy. But at the same time, it's also a very resilient economy. I don't believe it's on the verge of collapse. Uh, I don't believe that it's about to implode. I don't believe we're back in the 1990s again, right? Um, and why do I say that? Well, one, there's a lack of the exter exogenous uh, external uh, adverse, cons adverse situation like we had in the 90s in terms of famine, natural disaster, right? But second, even with all the sanctions pressure, and I'll get to that, um, my conclusion is that the, the North Korean economy has kind of this resilient layer due to several unique coping mechanisms, right? What are, the, what are some of those coping mechanisms? I won't give you an exhaustive list, but a, a couple of them that are very unique uh, to North Korea. Uh, first, the informal networks that cross borders, especially into China, uh, but also work within North Korea, that have existed for hundreds if not thousands of years, right? Unique. Um, Second, these informal networks have been sharpened and honed through the last several decades of the North Koreans being a quote unquote rogue state or otherwise isolated from the international trading system, right? So you have a str this base of informal networks, that informal network is called on even more over time. Third, I would say another 
point of resilience is that the ability of the North Korean state, almost like any other state in the world, to mobilize resources on a non-monetary basis. Right? It's a unique ability right, that the North Korean state has. Four, self-censorship, for lack of a better term. Uh, the North Koreans have decided, the, at least the government has, to largely take themselves out of the international trading system, or at least parts of it, right? Right, parts of it. So they, they've, they've self-insulated in some areas as well, right? So it makes them less dependent, less reliant, right? They kind of engage. I'm not saying that they have totally withdrawn. They definitely engage, but they engage more on their terms, right? And it comes back to the point I just made, the unique ability of the state to both mobilize resources and control its policies, right? Kind of un half plugged or unplugged, um, as the case may be. Five, uh, I would say, in terms of um, the the other part is the regime legitimacy, right? It come it dovetails with the point about the state's ability to unique ability to mobilize resources, right? The 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 regime's internal legitimacy based on kind of the founding myth, the propaganda. You know, if you read the the Myers book, the cleanest race, that is what I'm talking about there, right? That gives the North Korean state the ability to call on its people, the ability to endure uh, things that other, I, you could argue, other free market uh, d democratic populations would not endure, so on and so forth, right? I don't want to overstate that. There are limits to that, but I think it's a factor, right? And finally, I would say I do think that there's something uh, built in. I'm not a big sort of cultural anthropologist, but I do think that there's an element of Korean resiliency that you see, right? In South Korea, right, the ability to adapt and overcome after the financial crisis, right? There is something unique about the Koreans, or at least special about the Koreans, maybe not completely unique, but special, the ability to take crisis and turn it into an opportunity. And it's a real uh, special trait of the Korean people, at least that, that I saw when I was there. And I, I am extrapolating out a bit, but I've talked to others who believe that too. OK, so we've got this kind of sick patient. We've got a resilient basement or foundation, right? I don't want to say it's a strong foundation. I don't want to overstate it. But it's, it's a, func a resilient functional foundation. But my, the hypothesis that I want to posit here is that despite this kind of resiliency that undergirds the situation, I do think that the model that Kim Jong-un has right now is not sustainable over time, right? I don't, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying collapse, I'm not saying coup, but what I am saying is he probably has to make some policy decisions in the not too distant future. Right? And these policy decisions, I'm going to get to those in a second, they're dilemmas for the state. I'll get to a few of them, and, and I won't go through all of them, but I, but, I, but I just wanted to set that up. That, again, resilient foundation, right? overall structure not sustainable over time. Right? Policy move probably in the offing. So let, let, me, let me unpack that just a little bit. Why don't I think it's sustainable? All right, first, let's, let's, uh, to, to kind of capture this, I always re rewind the tape to 2016, 2017, because I think that the data is a little more clear there. It's a little more murky now, but I think it's still applicable. But let's look at the situation 15, 16, 17, right? Kim Jong-un, right, has, has his hard currency coming down dramatically, right, point one. Point two, his relationship with every other country in the region, including the U.S., if you want to count us kind of in, um, is terrible, right? Worst relationship with his most important ally, the Chinese, in decades, right? Nothing really going on with the South Koreans uh, until you have some of the summits with Moon Jae-in. Nothing really going on with the Japanese. The Russian uh, summit in 2015 with Mr. Putin was canceled, right? And, uh, of course, us and all of that, right? So no real outside lifelines. That's the point there. So hard currency coming down, sanctions pressure coming up, uh, no outside uh, lifelines. Also internally, a lot of churn, killing elites, killing threats to his regime, all of that. All these nuclear test allocation of resources into the nuclear missile programs, like heavy, heavy, heavy allocation. So my point there is that's, I always said that, you look at those plus some other factors, it's a little like driving a car about 150 miles an hour down the road, right? You can drive the car fast for a while, but eventually something's got to give, right? And something kind of did give in terms of the summits, and I'll get to that point in a second. At the, at the same time, you have this model that I don't think is overly sustainable over time. You have 
the, especially when the Trump administration coming, comes in before the summit, but I would also attribute two of the, the legs here to Obama as well. Um, you have what I would call a three-legged pressure stool, right? You have strong economic sanctions that are building over time. Remember, sanctions are kind of coming up under Obama, the end of Obama. You get the first sectoral-wide sanction in 16. You also get a lot of the activities that later would get rolled into sanctions, right? targeting uh, overseas laborers, right, so on and so forth. Curtailing North Korean economic activity informally through political means gets, starts to get rolled into sanctions later. But you have that, that the inception of that or the continuation of that in 15-16. Uh, Those sanctions get much harder. 16-17, you start to pile them up. They get to the five or six we see today. Second is, I already mentioned it, they're isolated politically. Isolated politically, Kim Jong-un really doesn't take any trips outside of North Korea. He's there. They're isolated. They don't have any external light lines, lifelines. And the third element that when the pre President Trump comes in, and I'm not, I'm not casting a value on this policy. I'm just giving you an analytic uh, fact, I guess, or real, you know, just a, just more of a, a fact here. I, I, I guess fact is too, too. Uh, in my opinion of what, what the impact is, I'm trying to be more rigorous since I'm in an academic setting, I'm usually pretty sloppy. Um, uh, security, right? The, the, the threats to his security go up. That puts even more pressure on the regime. My opinion, Mark Lippert's opinion is, you know, the security threat is the most pressing and important threat for Kim Jong-un and the North Korean regime. And when that is there, that causes even more, that causes the other two legs of the stool to really basically uh, have a, virtu a vicious cycle up in terms of the pressure applied to the, the regime. Okay, so um, you've got the unsustainable model, you've got the um, three-legged pressure stool, stool, and I'm gonna wrap up with this because again, I wanna get into uh, a conversation. So this then, puts, there are multiple policy dilemmas, and I'm interested in hearing others, but I'm just going to kind of name three, uh, three of them. Go, this puts the North Korean regime into basically three policy dilemmas, right? First, causes more reliance and growth of markets inside of North Korea, right? Uh, you have these sanctions pressure, you have, you don't have the external lifelines, you don't have hard currency, you don't have subsidies, right? you have to figure out coping mechanisms, right? And everybody in this room knows that in the, since the breakdown of the 1990s with the public distribution system, right, markets have entered North Korea and they've grown, right? And what does that do, right? What does that do? They, they grow as a coping mechanism, right? What does that do? Um, well, first, it weakens con state control, right? The state is no longer the sole provider right? That's an important point, right? And the second thing it, these informal markets do is that they erode the relationship, and they're, they're related points, but it erodes the relationship between Kim Jong-un and his people, right? That's the second point. So you have control, and then you have kind of what I would call like almost kind of the, the positive side of the, re the relationship, right? The kind of warm and fuzzy part, that's eroded. And then third, it starts to change the system, right? Money comes in, more free time, these rules, regulations, class system, all of this, this, you know, this, this kind of rigor that, that the uh, North Korean system has comes into play and starts becoming more and more pliable over time, right? And so when you have these markets that have, you know, grown over time, more sanctions pressure, the, the inability uh, politically to get hard currency from outside due to sanctions or diplomatic isolation and subsidies coming down, market, mar the reliance on market to basically make sure that that layer of resiliency remains intact goes up, but the state is being undermined in some way, shape, or form, and that bothers the state, right? So they've got to figure out how, what to do about these markets. That choice gets easier, not harder, with hard currency. Right, because you can close down some markets, you can, re you can basically put state, um, state, su state substitutes for these markets elsewhere, you can try to you know, build infrastructure or things that give a state imprimatur on the economy disproportionately. You just have more options as a policymaker, right? That gets harder. The second thing it does um, is that it makes the big strategic decisions with with you, that you have to have hard currency for tougher, right? How much money to put in the WMD program? How much money do you give to elites? Uh, 
How much money do you put on prestige programs, right? All of those, how much money overseas are you going to allocate to do activities, right? Those decisions get much, much harder, right? So you've got these two things happening at once, right? You've got the big budget decisions that are strategic, right, and resource allocations harder, also state control weakening because these informal uh, markets are growing. So it's kind of this double-edged sword that is or, or two-pronged effect, for lack of a better term, coming together at once. That's policy dilemma one, right? The, the second thing uh, that it does is that it increases its dependence on China, right? So um, while, you know, there's a lot of obviously uh, criticism about the Chinese and, you know, how much they're complying, how much they're not, I, I'd say, you know, that's an interesting conversation to have, an important conversation, because, you know, if, if you really want to hermetically seal or really ramp up sanctions pressure, your fastest straight line distance on the map is obviously through the Chinese, right? And probably the best evidence of this is once the Chinese started to agree to broad sectoral UN Security, sanction, UN Security Council sanctions, the sanctions efficacy went way up, right? There's a whole host of, of rationale, but that's just one example. But in this kind of pressure world, for lack of a better term, <coughs> the things that where the North Koreans can fall back onto right, generally involve the Chinese economy, right? The informal networks, now the ship-to-ship -ship transfers, laborers to a lesser extent, right? The loopholes, for lack of a better term, right, that's an imperfect term, run disproportionately through China. And while the rest of the world is essentially reducing uh, its, its openness to having North Korean activities, that would generate hard currency, right? So again, so the sanctions are coming in, these other activities outside of sanctions are coming down, right? Reliance on China goes up, right? And that generally is not a foreign policy position that the North Koreans want to be in. They're a little like a number of other Asian countries that want a hedging strategy. So you're putting the North Koreans, you're taking away a, a, essentially a hedging strategy from the North Koreans, and that's, I think that's a policy dilemma. And then the final one, which is almost self-evident, uh, I won't spend a lot of time because I'm already at 15 minutes, is how to play the nuclear card, right? Their big chip in the game is the nuclear weapons program and the missile program, I guess, to, to, a, to a, a certain extent as well. And it then puts more pressure on how you play this, right? And we can go through that uh, a little bit more um, uh, in detail, but the bottom line is how much, how fast, if at all, those questions get tougher, right? They get tougher because the, the, the choices get sharper, right? And so I'll kind of end here before, let me just wrap up here and say, I think, you know, right now in North Korea, I think you see some evidence of these um, policy dilemmas in a couple of forms, right? One, I think most people who follow it closely, and I don't follow it uh, nearly as closely as some folks I see at the table right there, um, I actually call them, um, but I think you see a lot of people saying uh, there's a lot of internal discussions going on in North Korea. So that's what some people think. All right, so you're nodding, yes, okay, yes, so that's correct. All right, second, um, I do think that um, You've seen, what I think is interesting, you've seen some indications, and I don't want to read too much into this, but uh, more emphasis, at least rhetorically, on Byungjin and Jukje, which is interesting, right? Kind of a little bit of a deviation. And third, I think it was a week and a half ago, right, they started to ramp back up the uh, rhetoric on sanctions relief again, right? Because obviously the easiest thing that gets them out of this dilemma is the sanctions relief and hard currency flowing in. And all of that does what every government official, and I can attest to, um, uh, uh, I can attest to this as having a 20-year career in government, every government official, if you don't have to make a hard decision, play for time. Play for time, right? And, and sanctions relief gets you, gets you a hard currency and basically more lubrication in the system and makes the, 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 the decisions easier and makes them less pressing. Right. So I think that's those are I think and I think that's why you see a little bit of the sanctions talk starting up again. All right. Uh, just to conclude um, our the, the basic summary here. Right. I, I do think there's a resiliency to the economy. I don't think it's uh, about to collapse. I do think the model is very difficult to sustain over the long term. I think it means that there there probably has to be some sort of decision, at least in the medium term. Um, the, the sanctions, I think, are working, and they do make the, the situation harder to manage for the North Koreans. Um, 
And I think what's interesting, if, if I were a U.S. policymaker, I would be uh, spending a lot of time focusing on these and other policy dilemmas uh, and how those policy dilemmas play into the possibility for both nuclear negotiations as well as some of the other uh, what I would call ancillary issues that surround uh, North Korea um, to this day. So let me stop there. It's 18 minutes um, and open it up for questions. Hope that was helpful. I was assigned by my boss to moderate this <laughs> Q&A session. Uh, any questions? Yes, um, let's start with John and the lady in the back. The big gargantuan U.S. military base at Pyeongtaek has uh, just opened. Uh, I think it's the largest base anywhere in the world, and it's going to grow even bigger. And I'm just wondering, since your DOD background and your time as ambassador, why in God's name did the U.S. government support relocation and, more importantly, concentration of U.S. forces at that base at a time when North Korea is forging ahead with its nuclear weapons capability? The estimate now is enough material for 50. Uh, and more importantly, you don't need nukes anymore. With their Ishkander missiles and their multiple rocket launchers, that's a death trap for the servicemen who are going to be stationed there. What the U.S., in my opinion, should be doing, and the Korean government should be encouraging, is dispersal of forces into more protected bases, uh, again, further back. But uh, I, I just don't understand the logic of the Camp Humphreys relocation. And why did we settle the South Korean government with the bill for that thing, I don't know what the number is, but I would guess it's 20 or $30 billion and still growing. So that's my question. Um, good question. You know, I guess what I would say is, um, you know, you, you, I think you kind of deal, you know, you're, what I, I guess what I would say is, you know, you're looking at, when you work in DOD and you're looking at basing, especially overseas basing, you're looking at this confluence of political, economic, security, right? And obviously you want the security issue to be paramount. I think everybody would agree, um, and then I would say, yeah, economic, that's financial, I guess. You would say, every. I think most people agree getting out of Seoul is not a bad idea, right? You've got, you're right in artillery range. It's a really tough place to, to mobilize from. You know, it's just having a lot of people in Seoul is really tough, right? Um, I think that's, that's point one, because most people will tell you the biggest card the North Koreans have is the artillery, right? Because, you know, there are other armaments we can sort of, they're not spending a lot of money on their conventional forces. There's reliability questions, all of that, right? But I do think that you have to factor in artillery will work. Right, it will work. It's simple. It's easy. Right, it's it, and it's very effective. And there's very little to stop it. Right, so I think that's I think artillery to me. And I'm not, you know, an army guy. I was in the navy as an in intelligence officer, and you know, we never, I never really encountered artillery in my career. We were in Iraq, a kind of a lot of tribes, but not not artillery. Um, um, the um, so I think that's that's point one. Then the question is, you know, you get into this really interesting conversation, which I think you've hit, hit your head on, like the 2000 and kind of four, three, four, five decisions to come away from small little bases all over the place into basically two hubs. Now, you could argue three hubs if you count Busan and Chinhe. Um, you know, I think that's, I tend to think we did the right thing. Uh, it, it was actually the Bush administration who started it and the Obama administration who implemented it. I tend to think it was the right thing. Um, that's the second point, because this, these dispersed bases were really expensive, really inefficient. You also had growing local political considerations for a whole host of reasons. I tend to think people got to the right conclusion. And finally, you know, I think the, the, the big thing is if you do big, build, build big bases, which I do think is the right decision over time, um, I do think you just, what you have to do is work on more effective means to protect it, right, from the, 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 the threats you face. Um, and can technology catch up? I think that's a, that's a real question. We, 
in the Navy context, we deal with it a lot with carriers, right? Can you protect the carriers? How much EW do you need? All of that stuff, right? And, uh, or are you better off just saying, carriers don't work, let's go to submarines, right? It's not, not totally disconnected from the conversation, the, the arguments that you put forward. It's really interesting. To, but I tend to think it was the right move. I tend to think that it was the, you know, the, the, that, the, that, that despite some security risk consolidation is a good thing, um, net net when you look at all the factors and then finally on the price tag you know it's i th my my recollection is it's a 10 billion dollar price tag and the koreans paid 92 to 96 percent of it um and it's amazing and you know i i always say you know that is one of the biggest pieces of evidence that the koreans are absolutely not free riders right you know i think that's 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 the you know and then you go down their their weapons uh, procurement four to eight percent uh, d defense budgets increase over time. Uh, and then, you know, to me, the big one is mandatory conscription, right? I mean, talk about sacrifice, right? Mandatory conscription. So I, I guess um, to answer your question, I think it was a, it was a very much a, a, a combined decision between the two capitals. And I'll just, I'll just, and I think both sides felt good about it. I think both sides continue to feel good about it. And I do think it is the right outcome. I'll just say this finally. Um, uh, this is not quite to your question, but you know, there's kind of this myth that the that the U.S. shows up and and you 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 know this, but but I just for the rest for the rest for some of the other folks, the U.S. just shows up and uh, we kind of tell everybody what to do. And let me just tell you, I uh, you know I spent most of my time pleading, begging, cajoling, um, you know, trying to get incremental gains uh, in Korea, and you know the Korean it is it is a great partnership. But it's an active, vocal partnership. And the final point, why do I have confidence that um, it's the right outcome? One of the main reasons is because when you work in that alliance as a military officer or a, a, a diplomat or an intelligence official, it's a real alliance. I mean, it is deep. It is, we talk military um, issues. We, it is, the, the both sides put a ton of effort into it. It is a real threat-based military alliance where we have a lot of discussions on capabilities on all, all that. So for those reasons, I, I do feel that at least one of my main undergirding rationale, I feel very good about where we ended up. But imperfect, and you're going to disagree anyway. Ken's nodding, and so we'll let the debate continue. So there you go. Hi, I'm Soyeon Kim uh, with RFA Radio for Asia. Um, I'm going to give a little off-topic question again. So uh, both North Korea and the U.S. are talking about they are ready for uh, the working level meeting um, soon. I'm not sure if that will be the end of this month that North Korea wanted, probably not. But let's say uh, after two summits, we haven't really seen that much progress. Um, and this time, both sides, both North Korean and U.S., probably want to see more tangible outcome from uh, the meeting. And in this case, how, um, what do you think the both sides will bring? Which cards they will bring on the table, or they will, uh, or they will just uh, stick to the same? posture that they used to have? How, how do you uh, predict this, um, if there is a, um, another meeting? Um, Thank you. Yeah, I used to, uh, so when I worked for the government, you always had an easy out on this question, which is, you know, you don't speculate about what's going on. Now I don't work for the government, so I can speculate, but so it will lead me to the, the second answer. I, I, I just, I've, I've given up trying to predict uh, this, uh, this set of um, interactions. It's just been very difficult to predict uh, in terms of what, who will show up with what when, right? Uh, really hard, right? If you would have told me two or three years ago about all these series of interactions and the outcomes, I wouldn't have believed it, right? So I, I think it's a long way of saying I've uh, injected a lot of humility into my predictive uh, analysis and capabilities. Um, I guess the, what I would say is, you know, you do have a moment here. Uh, you have a moment where if the North Koreans um, brought something significant and substantial, uh, you could make some progress. That's kind of my read of the situation. So, and I've always said that I do think that, and we can quibble about is it enough or, uh, you know, is it the right things, but to, me, to my mind, and you can also you can also argue 
are these the right things to do? But I think to my mind, um, I think it's hard to argue that the Moon administration and the Trump administration haven't made good faith efforts and haven't put real cards on the table uh, in terms of trying to move the process forward. Um, and so I really do think it's incumbent upon the North Koreans to not get overly tactical, uh, show up with something. If they want a real process, and that's an open question, I think there are things that they can bring to the table uh, that, are that are sufficiently significant to ignite um, interest in Washington to continue serious negotiations, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I'm Sujin Park with the Wilson Center. Um, actually, she asked a question that I was thinking of. So as a kind of follow-up, I'd like to ask that this past week, we've seen a vortex of uh, political events with President Trump's uh, impeachment inquiry in the process. I'd like to ask how much of a factor that would play in to possible uh, spillover to the, to the negotiations with the North Korea and whether it would, uh, I mean, I guess you would have to speculate, but the positive or negative impacts that it might have. Um. Uh, yeah, again, um, <laughs> I just, I, you know, again, uh, really, I guess what I would say is this. I, I lived through one impeachment inquiry in uh, President Clinton. Um, I actually worked on Capitol Hill during all of that when the, 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 you know, I actually worked in the Senate when the Senate did the trial, um, which was kind of surreal to watch. Um, but, um, and it didn't seem to have much of an impact on foreign policy. Um, Full stop there. That's it. Uh, I'm Kevin Lee, a first year student from Alice School. And my question is that uh, if, assume that uh, the sanction uh, policy uh, of the US and, uh, and other policies uh, finally fail to prevent uh, North Korea to have the usable nuclear weapon and the ICBMs, what action will the uh, US to deal with that? Basically, <clears throat> your question is, and let me make sure I got it right, it is um, sanctions don't sufficiently curtail the ICBM program such that the North Koreans develop and are able to basically develop an ICBM capable head of the United States that's miniaturized and the reentry processes is all worked out. That's basically like you get an a fully functional ICBM pointed at the United States. That's, that's basically your question, am, am I right? What would the US do in response to that? Um, there's a lot of speculation here. Um, <laughs> I mean, what I would say is the US is already doing some things about it, and one of the big things that we did under the Obama administration um, was to invest heavily in missile defense. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, missile defense is, 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 is an expensive um, undertaking. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, at the end of the, the day, um, when I worked in the Pentagon, the Secretary of Defense got all of the really tough um, resource allocation questions after the budget process ended, right? So you'd, the budget, the deputy would run the process. You'd kind of, you'd spend almost the full year going through the process, making all these evaluations. And the president basically always, or the, the, the secretary of defense, and to a lesser extent the president, always got the extra credit problems and the really tough extra credit problems. But one of them was what, what are we doing about uh, Iran, North Korea, other kind of these, uh, uh, um, these states that may or may not have missile programs, right? And, and North Korea, in that case, one of the things that, that the secretary made clear and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is that we need more missile defense. And so you looked at what the United States did, you know, starting from, not even, yeah, you could rewind the tape, but I always sort of start it in about 2010, 2011, I think we put uh, two Aegis-capable cruisers, uh, maybe destroyers, uh, into Japan. Uh, we obviously added the, the THAAD battery on Guam first, and then we have the THAAD battery discussion in in South Korea, we have the ground-based interceptors in Alaska, and those are su su significant, significant uh, investments over time, right? Um, the other part you could argue then, do you see uh, a buildup of U.S. forces um, in kind of Northeast Asia? I think 
it, this waxes and wanes and the forces are kind of deployable so it's hard to give a an answer at least where I sit I don't study it every day but I do think there is more capability uh, in the region than there was you know 20 25 years ago and I think between those two things it gives you a good basis as a policymaker to just to start thinking about uh, what your options are should the sanctions regime um, fail and I think the other part of that is that makes it even harder what if the gore um, essentially gets developed to a point that it becomes a viable second strike capability, right? And you can't find it um, re with reliability, right? What then? That gets even harder over time, so. Greg Brzezinski from uh, the Elliott School. I, I actually want to ask for, for you to do some more speculation, perhaps. Um, but I've just been, you know, very interested in the China-North Korea relationship and how that dynamic influences what the United States is doing. Uh, of course, as the United States ramped up its diplomacy with North Korea, Kim Jong-un uh, made a number of visits to China, and then you had uh, the recent visit by Xi Jinping to North Korea. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what you make of this. Uh, why, you know, maybe why do you think uh, there's been this um, intensification of diplomacy on China's part uh, towards North Korea, and also uh, how you think that will play into uh, the diplomacy between the United States and North Korea. No, great question. Um, all questions are really good. Um, and it's uh, been a while since I've thought about basing and ICBMs and uh, and the, the, the Chinese uh, dilemma here. So really, really good questions. I guess what I would say is, um, you know, the Chinese to me always feel conflicted on North Korea. Um, you know, it feels to me that they really, really, and I'm not a China expert, let me just start with that. Um, I would say first, you know, what, what it seems to me is what their, their, their paramount goal is obviously stability, right? And their second goal, and they kind of slide these two goals interchangeably depending on kind of the situation is denuclearization. They state it, right? Um, but I think to me it's always, I, my read has always been stability is the most important thing. Denuclearization is important in terms of, I always kind of read it as having a process towards denuclearization that then reinforces stability, right? If you can point to a process, if there's something underway, the Chinese can then go back and say, well, look, things are relatively stable but we have to work the denuclearization through this process. Um, the interesting thing comes when, you know, the Chinese show up and say, well, you guys, the U.S., you have to do more and you have to talk to the North Koreans and all of that. I think that's where the Chinese really get conflicted, right? Because I think they want a process, they want stability, they want negotiations, but they don't want the North Koreans to leave the Chinese orbit, for lack of a better term, and start, uh, you know, uh, a budding relationship with the United States, right? That is not, not, not in the Chinese interests over time. So you have this kind of conflicted, often schizophrenic uh, uh, kind of messaging that, that you'll hear from different parts uh, of the Chinese system. Uh, I guess what I would say my read is that, you know, uh, Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un were quite, uh, uh, quite uh, angry at each other for a whole host of reasons for uh, starting with Kim Jong-un's ascension in, you know, what, 2012-2013 time frame. Um, and it sort of devolved into almost like scorpions in a bottle, right? And it was uh, a testy, angry relationship. Um, what, why, and so why did you see summits after that? Um, I think two things. One, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un um, was granted a summit with President Trump, um, and that did two things. One, it increased uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, leverage, I think, to have a summit on his terms. And two, it created more urgency in the Chinese system to have uh, a summit uh, with uh, between the two leaders before uh, they talked uh, to uh, President Trump. So I think that's that's kind of my read of what unfolded there and continues to unfold, especially when these summits are very much uh, in play. Uh, final point, I would say, it also underscores why multilateral diplomacy is really important uh, in the region, right? You've got to try to keep your allies on side. You've got to maintain tight coordination uh, with, with those camps, right? Especially the Koreans, but not limited to. The Japanese are also important here. Uh, but then, you know, it's not insignificant you know, I mean, the, the Chinese are obviously a huge part, and the Russians, right? And, and doing all of that 
in a coordinated way why you're negotiating with the North Koreans, why you're trying to deal with the threat. That's not always easy to do, right? But nevertheless, it's critically important. And when you, you kind of see the results uh, often uh, when things go kind of amiss uh, in that. So I think the point here is that um, I, my read again, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, to me, it's pretty self-evident why these consultations have occurred at the leader level between Pyongyang and Beijing, uh, but it also underscores the need uh, for effective multilateral diplomacy uh, going forward. Okay, uh, we have a limited uh, uh, amount of time. We don't have uh, unlimited time? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm just going to be here all night yeah. anyway, so. Yeah, I hope uh, we can have that. This morning, uh, during the uh, morning session, I sent an email to Ambassador Lippert uh, saying, I uh, just want to make sure your GPS is working well to get you to the Elia school. And in 0.5 seconds, I think, he just replied, I'm here. And uh, that was my first time in my life to get instant email reply from former U.S. ambassador to Korea. And I think th that shows a lot of uh, how, how much uh, supportive he has been of our uh, program and conference today. With that, uh, please join me thanking uh, Ambassador Lipper. Thank you.